Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come, Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today, Mosiah 29 through Alma 4. Now, we kind of did Mosiah 29 last time, so I think we're going to start... We're not going to go sequentially. I think we're going to start with uh, talking about the Amosites, aren't we, Bryce? Yep. There is very little in the Book of Mormon that is more applicable to teenagers and young adults in this church than this story of the Amosites. And I find myself referring to it no matter what block of Scripture I happen to be teaching. It comes up in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then the Doctrine and Covenants. It is very pivotal. And to all the young people that might be listening, and especially to their parents out there, I just think this is such an applicable story. And not only that, but I can't think of a better example of how the Book of Mormon restores the plain and precious things lost in the Bible. One of the most complicated things in the Bible is made so clear and so plain by this story of the Amlicites. So let's just jump in. Alma chapter 2 is kind of the history, and then chapter 3 is the commentary. And so who would you even say the Amlicites are? Uh, The Amlicites are kind of this monarch group. You know, we've just come from a monarchy to a system of judges, and there's always going to be defectors. There's always going to be those that want to go back to the old ways and the glory of having a king. And so there's this group. I don't know if Amlicite is promoting this or his people are promoting this, but there's a group of people who want to go back to having a king like we've had for years. And Amlicite is the one that wants to be king. And so I don't know if he's pushing it to be king or if his followers are pushing it, but it's kind of a, let's go back to the way things are. And so these Amlicites want Amlicite to be the king, and there's a vote taken, and they are turned down. So the majority of the Nephites do not want to go back to the monarchy. They want to continue with this system of judges, or maybe they're just voting against Amlicite. We don't know, but they say no way is Amlicite going to be king. And so this group of Amlicites rebel against the Nephites, they break away, we don't want to be part of you anymore, and they go ahead and crown Amlici as their king anyway. And the first command from their new king is to go attack the, the Nephites that didn't choose him to be their king. Well, remember that there's more Nephites that don't want him to be their king than Amlicites. And so for the rest of this discussion, I'm going to refer to Nephites and Amlicites. Amlicites are former Nephites who break away because they want Amlicite to be their king. So now there's a war between the Amlicites and the Nephites. And then there's a slaughter. And the Amlicites take off, and the Nephites kind of chase them. Alma sends some spies to follow them. The spies come running back, absolutely horrified, because the Amlicites have joined the Lamanites. So now we've got Nephites, Amlicites, and and Lamanites. And the Amlicites and the Lamanites are going to attack the Nephites. Now, here's where we set up the symbolism, and here's the point that I think the Book of Mormon is making. If those three people go to war, if the Amlicites, Nephites, and Lamanites all fight, you've got a problem here. The Nephites know who the Amlicites are. They just fought a war against the Amlicites. It's like us, right? I know exactly who in my neighborhood is in the fourth ward and who's in the tenth ward. We know each other. And so the Amlicites and the Nephites know each other. So if I'm a Nephite and I go to battle and I pull out my sword, I can tell the difference between a fellow Nephite, who's my friend, and an Amlicite, who's my foe. I don't need any distinguishing features. I can tell the difference between Nephite and Amlicite. If I'm an Amlicite, I can tell the difference. I know that the Lamanites are now on my team. And I know the difference between the Amlicites who are on my team and the Nephites who I just rebelled against. But guess who doesn't know the difference between them? The Lamanites. The Lamanites are clearly a very different culture. They dress differently. Some may argue, I'm not convinced, but some may argue that there's a skin color involved. But clearly, the Lamanites know who Lamanites are, and they know that everyone else looks like Nephites. So if I'm a Lamanite and I'm running into this war, I don't know the difference between an Amlicite friend and a Nephite foe. And that's a problem for the Amlicites. So if they don't do something, their own teammates, the Lamanites, are going to slaughter them thinking they're Nephites. 
So if you'll go to Alma chapter 3, I think one of the definitive verses of the Book of Mormon, and Mormon's going to make this commentary. Alma chapter 3, starting in verse 4, the way the Amlicites solved this problem is it says, the Amlicites were distinguished from the Nephites, for they had marked themselves with red in their foreheads. And then this phrase, after the manner of the Lamanites. So it seems like Lamanites put a red mark in their forehead when they went to battle. Or maybe they did it all the time, I don't know. But the Lamanites had a red mark in their forehead. And the Amlicites wanted to be known as Lamanites. So they pick up a Lamanite mark and put it on themselves as if to say, we are not Nephites. We don't want you to think that we're on their team. We're on your team, so we're going to pick up your marks so that you know we're on your team. And right there is the main applicable point of this story. And this is what teenagers, for one, do all the time. There are so many people who were Nephites by birth, born and raised Nephites, but all of a sudden decide, I don't want to be a Nephite anymore. I don't want to fight for the Nephite side. I don't like them anymore. And so they defect to the world side. Now, how do you let the world know that you fight on their side? See, the world is going to take care of its own. If I'm a world's warrior, I'm not going to swing my sword at you if you're on my team. I'm not going to mock you. I'm not going to make fun of you. So if you've decided to change sides, if you are no longer a Nephite and want to be known as a Lamanite, what do you do? You pick up some of the Lamanite marks and you put it on your forehead as if to say, please don't think I'm one of those goody-goody Mormon boys. I'm not. I'm now on your team. So what is it that we often do? What are some of the more common Lamanite marks today that you could easily pick up to let the world know that you fight on their side? Well, one of the most common is language. I was shocked to find out that the language is pretty much worse in middle school than in high school. That may not be true of everywhere, but around here in the Salt Lake Valley, it's very common to find worse language being spoken in the halls of a middle school than in the halls of a high school. And I puzzled what that, why that was. And then I realized it's a Lamanite mark that's easy to pick up. If you're coming out of elementary school where your whole world has been your mom and your dad, and all of a sudden you discover that the world is out there and it's appetizing and you want to be part of the world and you don't want to be a Nephite anymore, you want to be a Lamanite. All you have to do is change your language. And all of a sudden, the world knows that you're fighting on their side. And every Nephite knows that you've changed sides. It's a way to mark yourselves in the forehead. Another very common Lamanite mark is our clothing. And we see it all the time, right? If you no longer want to be a Nephite and you want to be a Lamanite, there are some very, very common styles and even colors, and all you have to do is very quickly change your wardrobe, and everyone will know which side you're fighting on. Another common mark is the friends you hang out with. The friends you choose to hang out with is often a mark you put upon yourself. Now, the great beautiful thing about the Book of Mormon is there's the opposite. There's another group of people. There's a group of Lamanites who don't want to be known as Lamanites anymore, and so they pick up the marks of the Nephites, the righteous Nephites. So to, contrasting each other, you've got the Amlicites of early Alma, and then one of the very next stories are the anti-Nephi Lehi's. They do the exact opposite. They pick up the marks of the Nephites and wear them. So Alma chapter 27, 27, the contrast to the Amlicites, it says, and they were among the people of Nephi and also numbered among the people of, who were of the church of God. So they want to be known as the people of the church of God. So what do they do? And they were distinguished for their zeal towards God and also towards men. And they were perfectly honest and upright in all things, and they were firm in the faith of Christ even unto the end. So they picked up the marks of Jesus. Now, the beautiful thing is that you find that all throughout the Scriptures. In the Old Testament, the day of Passover was about putting blood on your house. In other words, you marked your home with the blood of Jesus. You marked your home with the atonement. 
And so I think one of the things this story is screaming out to everyone is, what marks are you wearing? Have you received his image in your countenance? And one of the ways you do that is you wear his personality, you wear his attributes, you pick up kindness, and you pick up forgiveness, and you pick up patience, and you put them on your forehead, and you act like Jesus so that everyone knows which team you're on. Or do you find yourself using the language of the world, the clothing of the world, the mannerisms of the world? Do you watch the television shows of the world? Do you take the world and put that on you? I think this is such a pivotal story. In the book of Revelation, there's a beast that has a mark. I think one of the things that this clarifies is the beast does not put his mark on you. Nor does the father really put his mark on you. I think if the Book of Mormon is saying anything, and I think this is Mormon's point, Mike, is we put the mark on ourselves. We put the consequences on ourselves. We are the ones that pick up the mark that we want to wear. Now, in the book of Revelation, that mark will get you spared or slaughtered. And in the book of Revelation, if you want to play on the world's playground, you got to be wearing the world's marks. So it's very tempting to pick up the world's marks and wear them. If one of the marks we wear is what we spend our time doing, then what does that mark say to your children that you're wearing? What do your children see you spending your time doing? That's another way we pick up the world's marks or we pick up the atonement by what we choose to do with our time. So I would just encourage everyone to ponder, what marks do I want to wear? What does the world perceive when they look at me? When they hear my attitude, when my language, when I talk to store clerks, When I bump into people all over, you know, what do they see when they look at me? And is that the mark I want to wear? Have I received his mark? Have I picked up the mark of Jesus? But Mike, I think one of the great messages of the Book of Mormon is that we do this to ourselves. We mark ourselves. And in the end, when Judgment Day comes, all the Lord has to do really is look at our foreheads and see what mark we've put on ourselves. What is it that you want? Do you want the cleansing of the atonement? At the very end of the Chronicles of Narnia, anyone that can look Aslan in the eye and his image is reflected back to him in your image walks through his door. And anyone that can't look him in the eye and whose image is not being reflected back, they cower and go through another door. And that's kind of how the Chronicles of Narnia portray Judgment Day is, is Jesus reflected in your countenance? Or do you find yourself wanting to fit in with the world, and so you pick up the Lamanite marks and say to them, I am on your team? Because if you want to fight on the Lamanite's team, you'll get the Lamanite's reward. But you won't get the Lamb's reward. There's a lot of things that this goes with. In Alma 3, Mormon kind of breaks down his whole point. In verse 26, he says, In one year were thousands and tens of thousands of souls sent to the eternal world that they might reap their rewards according to their works, whether they were good or whether they were bad, to reap eternal happiness or eternal misery according to the spirit which they listed to obey, whether it be a good spirit or a bad one. For every man receiveth wages of him whom he listeth to obey, and this according to the words of the spirit of prophecy. Therefore let it be according to the truth." And I really think there's these moments in the scriptures, specifically in the Book of Mormon, where Mormon relates a story, and then he kind of gives his prophetic midrash or his prophetic commentary where he basically puts his stamp on it and says, let me talk about why I put this in here, why I spent the time to put this in the text. And it seems to me to be what Bryce is talking about. Sometimes we think we're punished for our sins by this vindictive God that has a baseball bat, and he's just waiting for us to mess up. And I think one of the things Bryce is really fleshing out here is that these defectors that were once Nephites, they're doing this to themselves, and it's the spirit that they listed to obey. Now, Bradley Kramer wrote a book on this called Beholding the Tree of Life, and in this book, it really opened my mind to this concept that the Book of Mormon's doing more than just testifying of Christ, that it's actually prophetic midrash or prophetic commentary on the uh, Deuteronomistic historian's understanding of the Bible. What I mean by the Deuteronomistic historian is this. 
that in the 7th century BC, before Nephi and Lehi's time, there were editors that edited the Bible and came up with their theology. And the Book of Mormon, one of its jobs is to try to right that ship. That the ship of the Bible, as it were, in the 7th century, it existed, but the ship wasn't straight. That's partly why Lehi had to come about and try to fix things. Like, Lehi is saying, no, Yahweh's going to come down, he's going to have a body, and he's going to die. And the Jews didn't like that. They wanted to kill Lehi. Well, another thing that's interesting, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of literature on this in the scholarship, uh, one of the things that's interesting on this is this idea that we're punished corporately versus individually. Second Kings 21, the entire chapter lays this out, that the reason why the Israelites were scattered and why the Jews were scattered was because of their king, specifically Manasseh, that lived like 100 years before uh, the scattering. And I don't necessarily believe that. For example, I don't necessarily believe that we're being punished for something that was done in 1910. But there were a lot of people that lived in Lehi's day that thought this, that, hey, we're all punished corporately or as a group. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, I think his name was Achan. I always say his name wrong, Bryce. But, you know, remember that guy from Joshua? Remember the story with him where he, he takes this garment, he takes this, it's, it's this haram situation where he takes something that's been set apart by God and he keeps it to himself and he and his family and his goats and his chickens and his kids and everybody's punished for this. That's called corporate punishment. And it's interesting to me that in the Book of Mormon, we, we get one reference to it in, in Abinadi's narrative, where Abinadi says, hey, the third and fourth generation are going to pay for this. But outside of that little tidbit, there's not a lot in the Book of Mormon on we're punished as a group, but rather we are punished as individuals. There's a great book called Corporate Responsibility in the Hebrew Bible by Joel S. Kaminsky. There's this dance between these two ideas. I just want to read this quote from Kaminsky's book. He says this, A corporate view is not necessarily inferior to a more individualized form of divine retribution. While corporate ideas are sometimes less than equitable, they may allow for a greater leeway when it comes to divine forgiveness. Rather than viewing Ezekiel 18 as a superior theology that has come to displace the older corporate ideas, one can affirm the importance of both sets of ideas and come to understand how they qualify and thus complement each other. Now, I didn't read this, but in Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel, who lived after the destruction of the temple, says, wait a second, maybe we're not punished for what our grandparents did. In Ezekiel 18, he says, no, we're punished for what we do. And I don't remember this verse, Bryce, but I remember you brought it up. It was really good where when Lehi talks to his grandkids, and he's talking to the grandkids of Laman and Lemuel, and do you remember what he says to him? If you are cursed, I lift that curse off of you and I place it upon your parents, because if you were raised right, you'd do right. In other words, it's unfair for you to be punished because your parents rebelled and taught yeah. you in that way. So I'm going to lift that curse and put it upon their parents. Just beautiful stuff. The Book of Mormon is trying to explain sin and retribution, and it's balancing 2 Kings 21 and Ezekiel 18. The Book of Mormon's showing you that we're punished by our sins as much as we are punished for them. In other words, the consequence is preloaded in the action. And there's a reason this is very significant, because Latter-day Saints have a tendency to turn this doctrine the other direction and say, corporate salvation. So one thing Mike's trying to point out is, there are those who believe that we were punished as a group, not individually, and the Book of Mormon is trying to correct that and say, no, 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 we all take upon our own transgressions and have to pay for that. But we have a tendency as Latter-day Saints to turn that around and say, well, I'm going to be saved because I'm a Latter-day Saint, because I live in a righteous family, because my parents are good, I'm going to be saved. And the other side of the coin that Mike's trying to bring up is, no, 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 you're punished for your mistakes that each individual person has to choose for themselves. And that's why I love this story of the Amlicites. Every single one of us has to decide whose mark we pick up and put on our forehead. And I don't get credit for the mark that my parents put on their forehead. I have to pick up the marks that I choose. I have to bring about my salvation. I don't necessarily get to say, be saved simply because I'm part of a righteous group. Now, we're going to see this again with the uh, Zoramites. The Zoramites are going to stand up on their Ramiumptum and say, we're saved because we're part of the righteous group. 
No, you're not saved because you're part of that righteous roof. Do you see how all these stories kind of intertwine? So we've got the Amlicites here, and then we're going to get to the Zoramites in the same book of Alma who are going to claim the same thing, is that we're saved by corporate righteousness. Yeah. There's another thing in this chapter that I think is important, and I think Mormon is using some source material that we don't have in the text. It's this idea of skin color, marking, and cursing. And so this is important. We've talked about it before when we did 2 Nephi 5. For about five minutes, we talk about this. So we're probably not going to put a ton in this podcast on this. I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. But to reiterate on some of these ideas, if you go to Alma 3, this is Mormon, verses 6 through 12 is his commentary. In verse 6, he says, The skins of the Lamanites were dark according to the mark which was set upon their fathers, which was a curse upon them because of their transgression. Now, I'm with Bryce. I don't take this literal, but I do understand that readers take it literal because that's what the text says. Even Sprout wrote a document where he likens this unto the temple context, unto a, a temple context meaning that if your skin is white, you are pure, and if your skin is dark, you are outside of, of the covenant itself. In other words, that it's figurative. We'll reference Ethan Sprout's stuff in the show notes, but know this, there's lots of ways to read this. I don't take it literal because of some of the other things that are going to be said in Alma 3. If you read the whole thing in context, for example, go to verse 11. Verse 11 says, It came to pass that whoever would not believe in the tradition of the Lamanites, but believe those records which were brought out of the land of Jerusalem, and also in the tradition of their fathers which were correct, who believed in the commandments of God and kept them, we're called the Nephites, or the people of Nephi from that time forth. And so there's this political religious distinction to me that's in here that has nothing to do with the color of your hair, or the color of your skin, the color of your eyes. Uh, and it, the political religious distinction is this. Do you follow the political leaders of the Nephites, and do you believe and follow basically the rules of their religion? If you do, you're a Nephite. Later, the authors will say, anybody else is a Lamanite. They're just not part of our group. In Jacob, this distinction is even further detailed, where they list through all the tribes in Jacob 1, and then they say, but we're just going to call all these people Nephites. We're just going to keep it really simple. But back to the text, look in verse 7. Their brethren sought to destroy them, therefore they were cursed, and the Lord set a mark upon them, yea, upon Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael. I think what Mormon's doing here is he's citing a text that we don't have. I don't know if he has the small plates in front of him yet. If he does, he could be citing those. But if he doesn't, there probably was this tradition that lasted a thousand years that God put a mark that they might, verse 8, be distinguished for the purpose of, verse 8, not mixing and believing in incorrect traditions. Why? Verse 9, so that they might not mingle their seed. That seems to be what's going on. But the reason why I don't take it literal is because of 3 Nephi 2. 3 Nephi 2, verse 14 to 15 says that their skins were made white when they were baptized. That's a very interesting thing. I don't take it to mean that you go from having a dark skin to looking Scandinavian when you come out of the waters of baptism, according to 3 Nephi 2, verse 14. I think that means that the thing that prohibited intermarriage, intermixing, Whatever that prohibition was, they're going to call it dark skins, that was lifted. I don't take it to mean that they went from super tan to super, uh, you know, Scandinavian instantly. Another text I want to bring up is Alma 23, and I find this interesting. This is also referring back to what Bryce talked about earlier with uh, anti-Nephi-Lehi's. If you remember, the anti-Nephi-Lehi's were people that were Lamanites, and then they became Nephites in the sense of, they believed in Jesus, and they followed the commandments, and they associated with the Nephites. In Alma 23, verse 18, it says this, They, meaning the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, began to be a very industrious people, and they were friendly with the Nephites. Therefore, they did open a correspondence with them, and the curse of God did no more follow them. And so, to me, I read that to mean they could now intermix with the Nephites and have children with them and those kinds of things. So we brought it up earlier when we did 2 Nephi 5. Here it is again in Alma 3. I think what's happening here is that they made certain ways that they could be physically distinguished from the Nephites 
so that they didn't mix with them and associate with them. Yep. And I think this is the whole gist of this story of the Amlicites. The very fact that skin color comes up in the story of the Amlicites seems to be a commentary that it's something we put on ourselves, that the Amlicites put the mark on themselves. And we can mark ourselves as not part of God's people, or we can mark ourselves as I am part of God's people because I am taking his name, his personality, his attributes, and putting them on ourselves. And I think the other thing we need to point out is, look how much clarity it brings to biblical issues. This is a great example of how the Book of Mormon restores plain and precious truths that were lost over the years from the Bible. And and one more thing before we jump to the next subject is just somebody who reads the Book of Mormon in 1850, they're going to read it differently, especially if you know much about American history. People just had different views on other individuals based on skin color. And we've said it before, but I'll say it again. As a church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we do not look at uh, racial distinctions, skin color, nationality, hair color, anything as anything meaning you're better or worse than anybody. We are all God's children. And so uh, 2 Nephi 26, 33, all are like unto God. So I just wanted to make that plug. But I'm also going to give people a pass, meaning uh, not everybody's had, you know, lives in the same historical time period as we do. So we just... We well, live not in a only that, time. but I mean, look throughout the scriptures. Nicodemus, a brilliant man, a scholar in the law, a leader among the Jews... He made the same mistake. Jesus says a man had to be born again. And so what did this brilliant man think? Are you kidding me? I have to crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again? Nicodemus made the mistake of interpreting literally when Jesus meant symbolically. And the very next chapter, the woman at the well, Jesus says, if you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I have, you'll never thirst again. And she instantly assumed literal instead of figurative. So Many people, many of our ancestors have made the mistake, and they've assumed literal when it may not have been literal, and I think we need to just grant them some mercy, and we've had a lot of time to to look at this text. We've been reading the Book of Mormon for many, many years, so if some of the early saints read that literally and made the mistake, and it's not literal, I can... Like Mike, I can give them a pass and say, well, Nicodemus made the same mistake. And and please give us a pass. If in 50 years you're listening to this, man, Mike and Bryce were way off on this. If we really (laughs) do believe in Article of Faith 9, if we really truly believe in things that will yet be revealed, many great and things pertaining to the kingdom of God will yet be revealed. So It's going to be good. Well, before we get into Nehor, I just want to cover this list in Alma 1, 24 through 30. There's a list of a bunch of things that the church is doing in the midst of a lot of problems. They're having hard times. Look in verse 24. It says, The hearts of many were hardened. Many members of the church are withdrawing themselves or having their names blotted out. So this is a very difficult time. And yet, right in the middle of verse 26, it talks about the priest not esteeming himself above his hearers. At the end of verse 26, they're all equal. Verse 27, they impart of their substance. Middle of verse 28, the church is having continual peace. And then it gets into how. Mormon tells us in verse 29 that they're exceedingly rich and they have a lot of things. And notice the list. It's a list of stuff that you need. Flocks and herds and fatlings. And then it even gets into an abundance of grain and even gold and silver. I don't know necessarily that this group needed gold and silver, or even if they use it as a medium of exchange. But many of these things in verse 29 are associated with living, and they're prosperous in verse 31, and they become wealthy, and they're liberal to all in the middle of verse 30. And I just, I like that, that in the midst of adversity, you can still be blessed. And I also think that Alma 1 is a backdrop to a lot of the things Bryce talked about, the conflicts that are going to come up in this culture. And to me, it relates to what I'm going to call the, the philosophy of Nehor, because Alma 1 really is another one of the, these guys we call Antichrist, right, Bryce? Yep. There's one of four that we've identified. But before we jump to Nehor, I really need to spend just a brief moment with chapter 1, verse 26. I know Mike mentioned it in his list, but I just have found in Alma chapter 1, verse 26, the very heart and soul of celestial thinking. And I just don't think we're ever going to be celestial people until we can master this celestial thinking. And I just, I have read this verse so many times over the years and thought about it and want to be a celestial person in my thinking. But let's go back and read chapter 26, or verse 26. 
When the priests left their labor to impart the word of God unto the people, the people left their labor to hear the word of God. And when the priest had imparted unto them the word of God, they all returned again diligently unto their labors. And then this phrase, the priest not esteeming himself above his hearers. For the preacher was no better than the hearer, neither was the teacher any better than the learner. And thus they were all equal, and they did labor everyone according to their own strength. There's the celestial attitude right there. I am no better than anyone else. If I happen to be a priest and it's my assignment to teach, and I have information that my learners don't have and it's my job to bring that information to them, it doesn't make me better because I have that information. The doctor not esteeming himself above his patients. The lawyer not esteeming himself above those that hire his services. The American not esteeming himself above other countrymen. It's this idea that I am not better. Going back to our podcast on pride, we often take something that I have more of. I have more of this, therefore I think I'm better, and so I persecute you. And the Book of Mormon just shouts out that that is not celestial thinking. You're not better because you have greater education. You're not better because you make more money. You're not better because you're physically stronger. You're not better because you happen to be a priest and have information that learners don't have. This comes up so often in the Book of Mormon, and it just shouts out, this is the attitude of celestial people. That's actually the springboard for Nehor, because that, Nehor fits that problem, doesn't he? Yep. So you just see that. We're, this is a foil here in Alma chapter 1, because we're going to start chapter 1 with Nehor's thinking, and we're going to balance Nehor's thinking with this concept that the priests aren't any better than the learner. Teachers aren't better than students. Maybe Alma would be a good foil, because Alma leaves his political position, he takes that mantle off, and he's like, I'm going to go fix the people and fix the church, and he leaves what the world would say is a great title. He retires that, as it were. The high priest not esteeming himself above his religious responsibilities. Yeah, that's if, a great point. And if Nehor was the high priest, he would have, he'd be like, I don't care about these guys. I just want to be cool. Yep. So let's do Nehor. So... We're not even introduced to his name in the first 16 verses. He's kind of a punk. Uh, he's, you know, notice verse 3. He's popular. He wants the priest and the teacher to become, you know, not have to work for anything. He, he has a different kind of theology in verse 4 where he's like, everybody's going to be saved. He doesn't do a lot of teaching about repentance. And the main thing I think he's after is verse 5, right? Verse 5 and 6, they, they're going to give him money. Now, I don't know if there really was money in 90 BC in wherever this took place. The first coins weren't really minted till about the middle of the 600s BC, but I think money is a good translation. And what I mean by that is whatever word was there, Joseph has to give us a word that we get. And so I think verse 6 is kind of an extrapolated out of that word money, where it says that he's lifted up in costly apparel. Over and over again, the Book of Mormon is always using that as the distinction. And I think that was their bartering system, their apparel, which we've talked about in other podcasts. And so he's getting this, whatever you want to call it, this wealth out of his preaching. And then he comes across Gideon, and he beats him up with a sword and kills him. And it's interesting, when they bring him to Alma and they go through his crimes— Notice the first crime they get him on is verse 12. They don't get him on killing a guy. They get him on priestcraft. It's interesting. So what do you do with verse 12 to 16, Bryce? What do you take out of this? I think it's, again, I think it's a contrast to what we're about to talk about, and that is equality. But Nehor becomes a very, very prominent way of thinking. If you search the name Nehor in the Book of Mormon, it's going to come up many times, and it's often the doctrine of Nehor or the tradition of Nehor. And so he's setting up this tradition of those who think they're better than others and that you should reward me. Now, the irony here is he, the way he's going to convince them to pay him to preach and the way he's going to distinguish himself as someone that's more important is by telling the people that everyone's going to be saved. So you don't need to labor very hard because everyone's going to be safe. So he's preaching equality in the eternities to create inequality temporarily. He's and, all about inequality, isn't he? And that's what Antichrists are going to do. 
they're going to twist the doctrine in order to get the, what they want out of the, you know, in the time being. So he want, I want your money, so I'm going to tell you that your salvation is assured, that everyone's going to be saved, so that you now give me my money. And you just, you need to learn to recognize that discrepancy in those who are departing from the truth. I just think Nehorism is a matter of, I'm better than you, and I'm going to achieve that by flattering you with things you want to hear. There's also this interesting idea in verse 13. Now, it doesn't really apply to us so much today, but this idea that his blood is speaking from the ground. Over and over again in the Book of Mormon, there's this idea of blood vengeance and that the blood will speak from the ground, and it's just really an ancient idea. And another thing that I find interesting about Nehor is, notice what it says. They take him into verse 15. So after they convict him, they take him to the hill Manti, And it says he was caused, or rather did a knowledge between heavens and the earth, that what he taught to the people was contrary to the word of God. And there he suffered an ignominious death. Now, what does that mean? Probably that he died in a way that didn't have honor. So there's this really old tradition in the Near East uh, that the first false preachers, they're they're these two fallen angels, Herod and Merit, they're fallen angels in, in the ancient Near Eastern tradition, that they corrupted the word of God, and as a result, the God of heaven caused them to hang between heaven and earth and confess their sin. There's another ancient Jewish tradition about this guy named Shamhozai. He's one of the angels, one of the fallen ones in the book of Enoch. And he falls from the heavens, and this is related to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and he causes all kinds of problems, and he rebels against God, and it says that he repented by the way of penance, he hung himself up between heaven and earth. Now, I don't know if the the chapter in the first Enoch literature was textualized before or after Nephi leaves. Sometimes just because we have a text, it doesn't mean that that's when it was written, My take on the Enoch literature is that it's really, really old. And this idea of being hung between heaven and earth as a way to pay for some kind of wrong, it really also could apply to Jesus. Jesus hangs between heaven and earth on the cross to to fix these wrongs. And so maybe all these really old traditions are tied up with Nehor, or maybe I'm just full of hot air. Maybe none of this is related, which kind of brings me to a pun. The name Nehor literally means to be full of hot air. (laughs) It also means to snort, like 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 a pig. And so here's my take. Maybe when Mormon wrote this, maybe Nehor had a bunch of names, and Mormon's like, I'm going to put him down as Nehor uh, because he is full of hot air, which I think is fun. The puns are really awesome. Again, the Book of Mormon's job is to point out how to come to Christ and to expose the enemies of Christ. And so once again, we take a look at an antichrist. We talked in a previous podcast about one of the ways you recognize antichrist is they will do two things. Number one, they will suggest that you are restricted, that you are captive, that you can't, you're not free. And the other thing they'll do is they'll suggest that you are a fool. And so Nehor comes in here and says, hey, you should lift up your heads and rejoice. In other words, this religion that's holding you down, you should shake it off. Because once you do, you're free. And I, I've, I've watched a lot of people leave the church, and the first thing they say when they leave the church is, I feel like I'm free. And so this is kind of Nehorism, that they're trying to say, look, the church is restricting. And, and again, the whole Book of Mormon is trying to expose the enemies of Christ to say, don't be fooled by their rhetoric. Don't get caught up in feeling like, oh, the church captivates me or holds me down, or that church leaders are hiding something or that I'm a fool for believing in church traditions. And so that's why I love watching the demise of an antichrist. Hold on to what you know is true. I want to point out verse 7, one of the ways we hold on in light of so much antichrist material, anti-Mormon material, notice what Gideon does do in verse 7. He admonished him with the words of God. The more we hold on to the words of God, the less we will be fooled by the knee whores of our day who are trying to fool us and trick us, which is really just for their own benefit. Nehor doesn't care about the people. He sees the people as simply a means of getting rich and being treated like royalty. So don't be fooled by the Nehors. I remember one time we were talking about this, Bryce, and you said to me something that just hit me. You said, if you were to put all the Antichrist in the Book of Mormon in a parlor, and let's say they they were all sitting by the fire... And they were all talking. They would not agree with each other. They wouldn't. They would tear each other up. 
But the one place they're unified is they want to tear down the truth. Yep. And I find that fascinating. We see some of this a little bit in the New Testament where we have these different political groups that they don't necessarily like each other, but they're united in tearing down Jesus. Now, I think these two things are related. I'm going to throw this out here. I think the Amosite Wars and the story of Nehor are both related in the sense that both the Nehor philosophy and the Amosites are looking for inequality, stratification of society and kings. And one of the big pushes of the Book of Mormon, it doesn't say this word, but I'm going to throw this word out there, is what I call the egalitarian ideal. And it's everything Bryce was talking about, how the priest is no better than the hero, the doctor is not better than the patient. Everybody in the eyes of God, are equal. And there's three main Amosite wars. Alma 2, 15 through 19 is the first one where it's like a two-to-one slaughter. Amosites lose. The second one is Alma 2, 24 through 38, and that's when they come with the Lamanites. So they're bringing more. And that's when we get into, you know, they're marking themselves so that they can distinguish. And that's where Amosite is killed by Alma. And then Alma's hurt. He can't fight in the third war, which is Alma 3, 20 through 25. But the Lamanites are beat back. Uh, the Amosites, Lamanites, that, that combination, they're beat back. And we kind of have this peace. But I really do think all these wars, all three of these wars, are really to teach that idea of verse 26 and 27 of chapter 3. Mormons really trying to use these stories to teach a point. And the point is that we really are in the driver's seat of our own happiness even in the midst of war. And I think, however I can say this, I just want to just bear witness, he knows who you are. And I do believe that we can have a modicum of peace, even in the midst of chaos. Not the peace the world gives, but I'm going to give you my peace. Peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. I have overcome the world. Yeah, I, I believe that. I believe that Abinadi, when he stood before Noah right before he's killed, and maybe even when he was killed, had a sense of, it's going to be okay. Pick up Jesus. Yeah, it's never, I don't think... whatever circumstance you're at, pick up Jesus, and you'll have joy. I don't think we're ever going to live in a time from here to when he comes again where everything is going to be peachy. We may have some times of, of sunshine, but it seems like mortality just sends a lot of storms, doesn't it? Yeah. So pick up the image of Christ, put it in your countenance, and you'll have joy. The church prospers in spite of these difficult times. Now, that leads us to chapter 4 and another doctrine that we have to balance, and that is in chapter 4, the wickedness of the church becomes the biggest stumbling block to the prosperity of the church. And so kind of as a counter message, we just simply say, look, even in difficult times, we can be righteous, and we can pick up the Savior, and we can receive the joy of the gospel. But the one thing we've got to understand is this gospel is spread more by our actions and our examples than by our message. And I think that's what's going to flow right into the Ammon mission. The Ammon mission to the Lamanites is going to send the message. We're going to contrast Ammon's approach with Aaron's approach. Ammon's going to go in there serving and winning hearts, and Aaron's going to go in there preaching. And Aaron goes to prison, and Ammon succeeds with Lamoni. And I think the idea here is we need to understand in these difficult times, whatever mark you pick up, the world is watching. And this church prospers by the example of its members, not necessarily our message. They see our actions long before they hear our message. I've actually had people tell me it was what I felt when you were teaching me versus what I was saying. They remember how they felt. Yeah. The example the church sets will either increase the prosperity of the church or decrease the prosperity of the church because the world is going to see us. So if we want this kingdom to roll off victorious, if we want the Savior to come and bring peace to this world, it starts when we as a church start living the gospel. We pick up the image of Christ and we show the world who he is. And when they see him engraved in our countenances, they will come seeking that message. If on the other hand, what they see in our forehead is simply Lamanite marks, no distinguishing features of Jesus in our foreheads, they won't care one bit about what our religion is trying to teach. 
May we not be the reason that the church doesn't prosper in our day. May we be the opposite. May be, we be the ones that pick up the images of Christ and place them all over the way we live. When you walk into the store and someone bumps into you, may you pick up the attitude of Jesus and be kind in your response. May we be forgiving and patient like Jesus is. May we pick him up and wear him in our countenance. I think that's the main point of this week's scriptural message. And with that, we will end. We'll see you next time when we do Alma 5 through 7. And as always, spread the good word. We'll see you next time. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.